WA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. In Louisville, Kentucky, reporters Olivia Krauth and Mandy McLaren set out to answer a question. Did the school district's longstanding busing program succeed as a remedy to segregation? The answer, as laid out in their remarkable news series for the Courier-Journal, is it's complicated. They're both here to talk about what they found in their reporting and how they did it. Olivia, welcome to EWA Radio. Thanks for having me. And Mandy, we're very glad to have you here as well. Happy to be here. Mandy, let's start with a quick synopsis of Louisville's busing program, which goes back decades. So the history here really starts in 1956, two years after Brown v. Board. Louisville at the time had two separate school districts like we see across the country today. You had a city school district and then a suburban school district. The city school districts integrated pretty promptly, but over time, as we saw across the country after Brown, a lot of the integration was very surface level, what you would call token integration, maybe where you'd have just a few students of um, the other race at a school that used to be legally segregated, either black or white. And so that led to, in the early 1970s, families from both the city school district and the county school district filing suit, seeking a merger of the school districts and for the districts to take a more proactive approach towards integration, which at the time, um, the Supreme Court had famously ruled that there hadn't been enough speed across the country and proactively integrating schools and that busing could be a remedy. And so Louisville began busing children, but predominantly it was Black students who did most of the moving around for those 12 years of school. Is that right? Yes, that was right. When the federal judge ordered the merger of the the city and the county school districts and and called for a plan to integrate the two. There'd been conversations back and forth about what that may look like for over a year. But when the, the ruling actually finally came down, I believe it was in July. And so the district had less than a month to pull this off. And at the time, the plan that Judge Gordon approved was one that immediately put the majority of this task on the backs of Black families, mainly who lived in what we locally refer to as the West End, which is a portion of Louisville in the West that through redlining and and housing policies that were racist had really cordoned that population into that area. And so at the time, whereas Black students would be bused for nearly their entire K-12 through careers, and it was really wild, like you would be going to schools all across the county. It didn't always make sense that white students would really only be bused two years of their K-12 careers. Olivia, I want to talk to you for a moment. You handled the fact check story, which I thought you did a nice job of sort of summing up some of the myths that had grown around busting in the city. But some of them were based on things that used to be true. Like, for example, students were assigned to schools based on alphabetical order, the first letter of their surname, or or students being assigned to schools solely based on race. But you also looked at a few conventionally held beliefs that weren't clear, true, or false answers. And one of them was on the money question. Did busing save money? What's the answer there? The answer to this question of how much did busing cost, we really, truly do not know. JCPS, the district here, has never personally done any kind of financial analysis of that question of how much specifically it's diversity-driven assignments has cost based off of different types of information, like how many students are being bused, how much it costs generally to transport students. We were able to put it around a few million dollars, I believe, which sounds like a lot, but compared to the district's overall budget, which is 1.7, 1.8 billion, it's nothing. Emily, I'll chime in here and say that one thing that has happened over time, and I think especially sort of exploded as a popular narrative in 2012, 2013, with the rise of the Tea Party movement nationally and in Kentucky, was this talking point about wasted money, and we should just return to neighborhood schools. 
folks will throw out figures that are never really fact-checked about how much money has been, quote-unquote, wasted on this effort that some have argued would be better spent just investing in neighborhood schools. Well, let's talk about some of those neighborhood schools, Mandy. You looked at Black students who were staying close to home, and many of those Black schools in those communities are on the brink of closure. And so magnet schools were supposed to help attract white students to enroll in specialized programs that would only be available in those West End neighborhoods. But what ended up happening? It's a very complicated picture what happened to education in the West End. And again, I like to take it all the way back to the 1950s with Brown v. Board because that's when you really start to see things change. And one thing I like to bring up in all of this is really challenging what I think has become like the myth behind Brown v. Board is that when schools were legally segregated, that black schools were abject failures that they were places where kids didn't have any sort of resources and they needed to be saved through integration. And I think one thing I hope this project accomplishes is showing that there was a bunch of neighborhood schools in the West End that, yes, they were legally segregated, which we all know is wrong. But for these Black neighborhoods, these schools were pillars of their community. The teachers there were treated as professionals. The children that went to those schools have fond memories and said they were learning just fine. And so what you see over time, so specifically in Louisville's West End, is when integration began, you see white families. Do we all know white flight happened across metro areas throughout the county? Certainly happened in Louisville as white families left the West End in favor of the suburbs, you had shrinking enrollment. So then we see school closures and we see consolidations. And that means that schools like one featured in our project, James M. Bond, that was named after a black Kentuckian, it closes. And what reopens in its place is now a school named after a white school board member. So you see symbolically these changes that I think we haven't given enough credence to in our reporting on this topic. And then farther down the road, like you mentioned, yes, you have schools that are just shuttered because of dwindling enrollment, or you have schools that, to be quite frank, have had their populations wiped out, cleared out, and replaced with a more what some have thought in this community, and wrongly, but a desirable population of students that are likely to have more parent involvement. And these are these magnet programs and these magnet schools that have popped up in the West End that, yes, they have attracted white and Asian families from other areas of the county. So you have these diverse schools in these Black neighborhoods, but the Black children that live around the corner don't necessarily have access to the fantastic programs and experienced teachers that work there. One thing about this project is it shows how important student voice is, past and present. I mean, that's critical to the storytelling here. And I think you really convey that these are real consequences for young people in their communities. And the busing affected everything, as you said, from the quality of their classroom experience to whether they had enough students to field a football team. Tell me a little bit about Shawnee High School. Sure. Shawnee High School, uh, home of the Golden Eagles, though that was not their original mascot name. For anybody that comes to Louisville, I just recommend just go over and to look at this school because it is stunning just in its architecture. It is this piece of this community's history that when you look at it, it almost doesn't make sense that something so grand could have been neglected for so long. And so this is a school that opened in 1929, originally as a segregated white school. Again, like I mentioned previously, as white flight happens, by the 1970s, it becomes a majority black school. And at that point in time, by all accounts, was thriving. The basketball team won the state championship. But then what you see as we move into the 80s is that when the district basically decided we were going to end busing for suburban students. So we would no longer have white students being bused into these black neighborhoods. However, we're going to continue busing out black children into the suburbs. And where that left Shawnee was that they no longer had students from, I guess what you would call middle or upper class households, primarily white, coming in. And what they instead, the way that the assignment plan was made up, they drew mainly from the surrounding neighborhood There is a historically white neighborhood called Portland right next door, but that 
neighborhood is also extremely, extremely low income. So what happened over time is at Shawnee, the students there really has like the most marginalized population in the school district. And the boundaries that have been set up, and we focus on this in that story, is that you could be a child who lives right next door to Shawnee, but because of this integration plan, you can't go there. You're bussed out to southeastern, southwestern Jefferson County, maybe 45 minutes, because that's part of this effort to have diverse schools. And so, yes, we looked at Shawnee High School's football team, which I think from a storytelling perspective, we thought it was a way to illustrate, especially during COVID when we can't go into classrooms and pick up scenes there to help tell our story and tell the story of Shawnee, that the football team and the fact that a varsity high school football team in a major American city only has a dozen kids on it. That's not normal. And that is directly because of the way that these assignment boundaries have been drawn to really, really limit the number of children that can attend that school. Olivia, you focused on the students being bussed out of the predominantly Black communities of the city's West End and into the mostly white suburbs. What do you know about the experiences, academic and otherwise, of some of those Black students? What are they facing there? We looked at it several different ways. I think typically with this conversation, we just focus on classroom diversity or not even classroom diversity, just school diversity. So when kids leave the West End, they do tend to be in more diverse classrooms. We found over time, especially recently, the schools that continue to be in the West End have become predominantly Black, predominantly poor. And when students leave, they're less likely to have that kind of double segregation. They face modest test score increases, which experts tell me is, you know, pretty standard. Of course, achievement gaps, massive. They're still there. And then you start looking at other types of disparities as well, where I found the disciplinary gap gets worse for students, specifically students who are, who are bust. You get into these schools all in the name of increasing opportunity. And yes, these schools, you know, the eastern part of the county tend to have things like more AP classes, but the students who are being bused there don't always get those opportunities. And then you have this larger issue of belonging and community and identity. And what does it say when you're assigned to a school outside of your community that, you know, you didn't choose and, How does that make you view yourself and the people around you? We're talking with Mandy McLaren and Olivia Kraut of the Louisville Courier Journal about The Last Stop, a new investigative series of the city's school busing program. Don't miss an episode of EWA Radio. You never have to. You can find us on your favorite podcast app. And thank you to everyone who has taken a moment to rate us on iTunes. Your support and your feedback are helping us to grow. Mandy, Olivia, we've talked some about what you found in your reporting. I want to learn a little bit more about how you did it. I want to say that I admire how you organize this series to satisfy different audiences. There are some quick hit pieces with highlights from across the project, deeper explanations, and there's a step-by-step case study of a theoretical white student and the choices and advances that he gets because of his geographic location and also because of opportunities that his parents may know about that other families don't. Can you talk a little bit about how you structured this series? It felt to me, obviously, that this was very, very intentional to try to reach people coming at it with different interests or perspectives. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I actually don't know if we ever like sat down as a team and said, we're going to, we're going to structure it this way for that purpose. I actually think, and I guess you, this is where you can give credit to the USA Today network is that this has sort of been drilled into us for everything we do to approach stories in a way where we provide that in-depth analysis or investigation, but always breaking off smaller pieces as we go. So I can talk specifically about that sidebar with uh, Harry, who, to be honest, I think I was just working through my draft of the main bar for that one that focused on the resegregation of elementary schools in the district. And I realized that there was this opportunity to pull it out because if you live here, and I, I do not have children, but I've met and talked to many people who, even if you grew up here, 
are so confused by how this system works. And if that's the surface level confusion, think of all the lingering or hidden disparities hidden throughout that. So quite honestly, I just one night, I thought I was done working for the day. And then I took my personal laptop to another room in my house and was just thinking about it. And then I typed up this scenario with a kid named Harry, play on Harry Potter that our editor didn't realize at first. He was like, what is a sorting hat? Um, <laughs> so that's how that that bit came to be. And let's let's bring our, our, our podcast listeners out of the dark, but it's a fantastic imaginary journey of a little boy named Harry with his parents figuring out where he's going to go to school in Louisville. And since he does not have a sorting hat to decide which house of Hogwarts he's going into, instead he's in Louisville Public Schools, you then walk them through these different scenarios in which he can take advantage of what seem to be loopholes that favor white families. Yes, absolutely. And I think as I was writing it out, I was like, this would be great if we could do it more from a visual perspective and bring in some sort of illustration or design. And I was really happy that we were able to pull that off. And I think one thing that we've learned throughout this project is being deliberate in how we choose to tell it and try to find ways that are more engaging to different audiences so though we never really sat down and had that intentional conversation about that, I guess we were we were doing it, not really realizing it. Olivia, what were some of the hurdles to getting and crunching the data for this story? Where to begin? <laughs> it started really um, in the beginning, Mandy very much wanted student level data. And we went through several kind of back and forth with the district on that and did not get student level data. So trying to figure out a way to still figure out what we were trying to figure out without having that level of data, that was probably one of the first hurdles. And then just getting everything back in a timely fashion from the district. A lot of this was based off of open records requests. And to the district's credit, a lot of the requests were requesting things that did not really exist in the format we needed them in. And so they would pull it for us as a, as a courtesy, which they are not obligated to do. But that also means it takes a little bit longer. So dealing with all of that, keeping it organized was a huge challenge for me personally. And making sure we weren't conflating Black student with West End student who is being bused, because there are Black students who do not live in the West End. But that kind of nuance is typically lost in a lot of the other kind of conversations about this. Can I add that on the record sides of things? Yes, the Courier Journal has this library in our massive newsroom that, of course, we haven't been in since March. And I went in there and was just pulling through envelopes to try and find photos that fit with the stories that we were working on. But one other logistical challenge in this has been COVID. And so for the court documents from 1975, a lot of those records have been kept by the University of Louisville archives. But because of COVID, they were not allowing anybody who was not a student or a faculty member into the archives to access them. So I lucked out because we have a really fantastic intern, Quintez Brown, who is a current University of Louisville student. So he was able to go in and pull the records for me, and we were doing it over the phone. And it's these things that popped up, especially trying to do a project in the pandemic that you didn't really anticipate at the beginning. So, Amanda, you were a teacher before you were a journalist. I'm interested in how that informs your work, especially on this project. So I spent seven years as a teacher and an administrator in New Orleans, and anybody who has ever taught there or reported there knows the reality of the city school system, and it's it's a story of segregation, quite honestly. The public school system is nearly entirely students of color. There are efforts underway to be more intentional about bringing white families back into the public system. But yeah, that was my experience, and I remember... I taught middle school students and I taught social studies. And there was a time when I was trying to figure out how to even talk about this with my students as, you know, I'm a white lady and they were all black children and helping them realize 
that there was something going on here, right? That the fact that this city that they go out in and they go to Mardi Gras in is not all one race, but somehow when they come to school every day, it is. And I think that really informed part of my decision to transition back into journalism. And I got very lucky that when I was in grad school, I got to work with Emma Brown at the Washington Post exploring open DSEG cases across the South. And when the job at the Courier Journal opened up, I had heard by that point so much and learned so much about the history of integration in Jefferson County that I was like, I guess this is a sign. I'll take this job and I'll get there. And, you know, at some point my goal is to dig into this and to do extensive reporting on it. And so that is, I guess you'd say the genesis of this project, but Really, I will say that over the past summer, obviously Louisville has been in the the national news because of the Breonna Taylor case and the sustained protests over racial injustice in this city. And that sort of propelled us forward to dive into it. Well, I mean, certainly those protests in Louisville and, and elsewhere in the country were about protesting police brutality, but also about running against systemic racism. And I think one thing that really is important in your series, to me, was an underlying theme, is that you can't separate what happens in these schools from the communities that they serve. That is very clear. There's this relationship um, and a longstanding one, longstanding impact of the busing program on these surrounding communities. Olivia, you covered the citywide protests following the killing of Breonna Taylor, and which continued to surge over the summer and into the fall after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And I'm wondering, where do you see the connective tissue for you in things that you were hearing or seeing then, and and maybe your work on this project? Is there a connection there? Yeah, I I think the the larger connection here, obviously, the Breonna Taylor protests were not specifically about education, but in a way, the underbelly of all of it was the black community in Louisville faces a number of systemic inequities. And the black community in the West End specifically has faced years and decades of disinvestment. JCPS and its busing program has played a role in that. I think watching the protests, covering the protests, made it clear to me just how important it is that we got this right because For so long, I think we have not gotten it entirely right, and it was time for that to change. Well, let's talk about what's next for Louisville. Let's talk about change. Olivia, tell us about Superintendent Marty Polio's plan going forward. So the district reviews the way it assigns students to schools every couple of years. So this time around, the district, mainly Polio, wanted a substantial change. So he's proposed this thing called the dual resides plan, where essentially the students living in and around the West End, the kids who are still being bused, are going to have a choice. And they can choose to go to a school close to home. So that would probably be Shawnee at this point. Or they could go to a school like the one they're typically assigned. Essentially, they would be able to opt out of busing in a way. So that's the very basic overview of dual resides. Is there any indication that anything might change in the plan as a result of your reporting? I'm working right now on sort of being the one to follow up and hound folks and say, so did you catch our stories? What are your thoughts? What do you think needs to change? And so I talked to one school board member this morning and she had previously said that she was in support of the dual resides plan. And She said that this project sort of reinforced her decision on that. But then I think also something that was interesting, we chatted about the elementary issue, which is not part of their plans right now. They have not tackled that, the resegregating elementaries. And from her, this is just one board member, but it was pretty much a, I guess what you might call a capitulation as far as, you know, we know that now we have 19 elementary schools that don't meet our diversity goals that we've placed on our selves and that in her mind at least the work shouldn't be to gerrymander more diversity at those schools but to do better by the populations that they already have so the reaction and the impact is definitely still ongoing so for reporters who are reporting on these issues in their own communities and of course understanding of these programs look very different depending on the district that you are in is there any organizations or resources you think they should definitely speak to that were especially helpful 
I was significantly helped by the Urban Institute's Data Explorer. It has a ton of data and you can kind of pick and choose what you want. But what I found incredibly helpful was the school demographic data. So you can get demographic data going back to the mid 80s, which we found was not necessarily something that our district kept handy and in a easy to send via email format. So that was a huge, huge help. And Mandy? Yeah. And I think once you get that data, there's plenty of different ways you can start looking at it, right? And just in concrete terms, how many schools in your district today are more than 80% white students or more than 80% non-white students? And how has that figure gotten worse or better over time? Like, are you seeing resegregation in your own districts? And then I think know the history of where you are and what you're covering. I think one, it makes your job more enjoyable to like see the through line of what you're covering now. And I think an invaluable resource is the elders in your community. They lived through this. They felt the impact. They know the ins and outs. They can point you to the other folks to talk to or the other consequential decisions that were made. So I cannot speak highly enough to the folks in this community that were really willing to talk to me about moments in their lives that were not easy, especially for these folks that at one time were little black children going into a school where they did not feel like they were wanted. And so I would just highly recommend talking to actual real people, which I know is hard in a pandemic, but it can be done. We talked a little earlier about some hurdles to to getting and finessing the data for this project. And I'm wondering, were there any other unexpected challenges that you encountered? One challenge that we had that really speaks to the circumstances in which we were trying to pull this project off is that in the fall, when we were getting ready to wrap things up and go out and get photo and video to, you know, put the icing on the cake, I found out that one of the main sources in one of the stories had COVID. And this was an individual that you were going to be extra weary knowing that they had caught it. You know, that was sort of like being shook back to the reality of what's happening in our community at the same time that Louisville is trying to process its lingering systemic racism. You also have communities that are being hit really hard by a deadly disease. And I'm very grateful that I can say that that person came through it and is fine, but it was definitely like, oh my God, this is crazy. Mandy McLaren and Olivia Krauth are education reporters for the Louisville Courier Journal. Thank you both for making time for EWA Radio. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story or reporters you want to learn more about, drop us a line with radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 70 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, take care of yourselves, and thank you for listening.